Hello, I'd like to welcome you to uh, Donner Doom 16. Uh, I am uh, my pleasure to present uh, Dr. Catherine Hill. She's a professor, president's fellow, and Showalter faculty scholar in the Department of Entomology here at Purdue University. Dr. Hill leads an internationally recognized program focused on the control of anthropod-borne infectious diseases that threaten public health and biosecurity. She also serves as the director of the, uh, of the Purdue Public Health Entomology Extension Program. Dr. Hill's research focuses on the discovery of new, safer strategies to control mosquito and tick vectors. Dr. Hill led the Lyme Disease Tick Genome Project, an $18 million, initi 18 million dollar initiative funded by the U.S. National Institute of Health that produced the first genome assembly for a tick. Today she will present a talk titled, Infectious Diseases and the Game of Thrones, Can New Technologies Prevent Epidemics of Mosquito-Borne Diseases? Now we ask that you please silence your phones, but don't put them away. We hope that you can tweet or uh, with the hashtag Don or Doom, posting to Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, or whatever social site you prefer. Also during this presentation, we'll be using the, the uh, Hot Seat app, which is an app produced here at Purdue. If you uh, do not have that downloaded yet, you may go to the uh, app store to, to download that uh, for whichever device you use, and uh, Dr. Hill will be explaining how we use that throughout the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, be here today and to present to you on this uh, Dawn or Doom talk. Um, in the infectious diseases Game of Thrones, you win or you die. I believe infectious diseases may be one of the biggest threats and challenges facing humankind today. And I'm going to explore the very interesting and very compelling parallels between global infectious diseases public health and the Game of Thrones saga that was penned by George R. R. Martin, really titled A Song of Ice and Fire. Now there are many infectious diseases. I'm a mosquito biologist, so I will be presenting on infectious diseases that are transmitted by mosquitoes. And I'm going to, of course, focus on Zika. My presentation today has three goals. The first is that I want to challenge the way you think about infectious diseases and our continued ability to control them. I want to help demystify some of the technologies that are being developed, the so-called dragon glass that scientists are using to combat mosquitoes and the diseases they transmit. And I'm going to uh, explore two controversial technologies. The first of those is one that we use uh, or heavily rely on already, and that's insecticides. And the second is GMO, or genetically modified mosquitoes. And I'll present the dawn and the doom. Lastly, my big, hairy, audacious goal, the BHAG, is I want to help you fall in love with mosquitoes. Let's see if I can do that. <laughs> I'm not going to offer you a position, um, rather a very broad overview of the options and the considerations around those options. And please be advised that the concepts I present today do not reflect the opinion of Purdue University. This will be more dawn than doom. I'm not one of those morning people, but I am an optimist. All right. As mentioned, we will be using hot seat uh, throughout this presentation so that the audience can participate uh, in the topics that we're exploring. Uh, if you don't have hot seat uh, downloaded, you can go to www.openhotseat.org. You can log in with your Purdue career account, your Facebook account, uh, your Google account, uh, or your own hot seat account. Okay. This is uh, a, a snap of the, uh, a screenshot of uh, uh, an article that appeared very recently in the Wall Street Journal. And here what you see is one of the employees from a company called Oxitec, which one, is one of the companies developing GMO mosquitoes. They are releasing GMO mosquitoes in a field trial. And the title uh, of the uh, Wall Street Journal article is, Mosquitoes are deadly, so why not kill them all? Let's start with that question. And I'd really like for you to, to participate. Uh, either you may agree or disagree uh, with that position. So please, please, you're most welcome to uh, uh, submit your um, opinions on that. And we'll see what the audience thinks. And then we'll see how your uh, opinions change <laughs> over time. All right. So I believe, uh, well, actually, I guess I could start up by saying that you know mosquito-borne diseases very well. These include things like malaria, dengue, yellow fever, uh, West Nile virus, 
uh, and now most recently Zika. In fact, humans have been battling mosquito-borne diseases uh, for millennia. And the fact that you and I are here today is proof positive that our ancestors were victors in those earlier battles. But the question is, will we be the victors going forward? And I believe that uh, there is a new threat beyond the wall, or that the threat beyond the wall for us is a new era in infectious diseases. Now, here's an interesting question too. Millions around the globe are hooked by the Thrones saga. It's described in five weighty tomes, about 4,500 words, all told. And books six and seven are expected to be each about 1,500 words. So Martin is not an author known for brevity. This is a very long story. And if you do the math, we're about halfway through. Now, today we like to communicate in 140 characters or less. We like to text. We like to Snapchat. We like, like. Um, and so I, I guess my question is, with such a, a preference for very short communication style, why is it that we're so hooked in such a very long story? Now, you could argue that it's the amazing plot lines and the colourful, flawed, tragic characters that Martin presents to us, the epic battles that take place between feuding families and the mythical creatures, they're almost like mosquitoes, <laughs> that are, and the incredible fantasy realm. You could also say that Thrones is the perfect antidote to an absolutely awful day. If you've had a bad day at the office, come home, hit the remote, and watch Tyrion deal with the office politics. <laughs> it just makes you feel better instantly. But I think that one of the most captivating story arcs for any of us is the idea presented in Thrones that there is something very big, something very bad, and something absolutely deadly out there, and it is coming for us. It's the growing threat beyond the wall, and you hear it constantly uh, whispered in that very depressing Stark family motto, winter is coming, winter is coming. Now this resonates for us because it parallels our own never-ending battle for mortal existence, our continuous fight against infectious diseases. If we quit, if we lose in the infectious diseases Game of Thrones, we die, game over. It's a very compelling story because it's our own story. And that's the hook. And that's why we've been paying attention for the last five books and six seasons. We've been promised a mega battle with a winner. And we're still tuned in because that hasn't taken place yet. We want the good guys, us, to win. So here comes the doomy part of my talk. It's the idea that infectious diseases are the threat beyond the wall. The last century marks a period of very significant uh, impact in infectious disease control in the developed world. We've had many medical advances that have radically reduced the number and severity of infectious diseases that we suffer during life. Dying from a microbial infection these days is now relatively rare in the Western world. Uh, in the US, lifespans have increased by some 30 years since 1915 as a result, really, of modern medicines. This has been achieved through a number of different strategies. One of those is medicines, and I'm referring to vaccines and drugs when I discuss medicines. Also insecticides, modern construction, sanitation, and healthcare programs. We've managed to put a dent in many um, diseases, including those transmitted by mosquitoes. Malaria and dengue, which used to be common in this country, are not so common anymore. Indeed, in the last 50 or 60 years, you could argue um, that we have come um, collectively to expect to live relatively disease-free for the vast majority of our lives. We also, in the developed world, expect to live without too many insect encounters. We don't like finding cockroaches in our houses. <laughs> now, that doesn't apply to our fellow human beings in developing countries who still shoulder the majority of the infectious disease burden. And as I said, human evolution has been shaped by mosquito-borne diseases um, for uh, millennia. We haven't always been free of infectious diseases. In fact, if you, if you look um, at the recordings of the ancient Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, you will see evidence that those civilizations were dealing with infectious diseases transmitted by mosquitoes. It's also recorded in our own DNA, which bears the signatures of our own evolutionary battles with infectious diseases. And I guess you could argue that in a way, this is probably the longest and most complicated book ever written. It's our own DNA code. Now, half of Europe's population was wiped out by the plague. Maybe some of you don't know that. Plague is not a mosquito-borne disease. It's actually transmitted by fleas. But this didn't happen once. This happened three times during the Middle Ages. 
it wasn't a very pleasant place to live the middle, in the Middle Ages in Europe. It wasn't, it wasn't a fun existence. It was a very uh, scary, depressing time. But if you thought life was better in the New World, you'd be sadly mistaken. The colonies here were um, plagued by uh, a number of mosquito-borne infectious diseases, dengue, malaria, yellow fever. At one time, uh, Charleston was described as not a place to go to live, but a place to go to die. And about and less than one third of the human population made it to their 21st birthday. And that's because of infectious diseases transmitted by mosquitoes. Malaria, in case you didn't know, was prevalent in this country up until about the 1940s and 50s when we started a massive eradication campaign to control mosquitoes that transmit malaria. And at the same time, in about the 1940s, we started to deliver modern antibiotics uh, for control of infectious diseases. We had uh, the discovery of penicillin and all of its derivatives. Also, beginning in the late 1800s, we made the discovery that mosquitoes can actually transmit diseases. And that then gave birth to the beginning of our efforts to control infectious diseases by controlling mosquitoes. Following World War II, um, we had the uh, development and release of, of what we just consider modern insecticides. Um, these are largely neurotoxic chemicals and they've been in very wide use to control mosquitoes. But there are some very strong indications that we are losing our ability to control diseases transmitted by mosquitoes and all infectious diseases. You've probably heard about multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Look what's been happening with Ebola um, and the outbreak of Ebola in Africa. Those diseases are not transmitted by mosquitoes. But the same thing is happening with mosquito-borne diseases. Dengue is on the rise. Uh, this is a disease that has exploded in the last 50 years, and I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. It's becoming um, potentially re-established in, we're very worried that it could become re-established in the United States. There's a yellow fever outbreak going on in Africa right now. So experts are warning that our continued control of malaria and other mosquito-borne diseases is seriously threatened by insecticide resistance. And then, of course, beginning this year, we had the global crisis that is Zika. I just have to show you my little mosquito, the threat beyond the wall. <laughs> so here's a great uh, picture. Uh, it's a screenshot from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. And if you didn't realize, I'm actually Australian. Um, so, um, and it's in, in keeping with the blue theme for this presentation, so I thought I'd use this. So um, on the 2nd of February this year, the, well, it's actually the 1st of February, the WHO declared Zika a global health crisis. And uh, since then, you can see there have been some uh, massive efforts uh, to control the mosquitoes that transmit Zika using insecticides. And what you're looking at there is a fogging application. Um, it's probably a synthetic pyrethroid insecticide, which has been widely used to control mosquitoes um, in an attempt to get on top of uh, the Zika issue. In short, it would seem that we are returning, uh, witnessing the return of old diseases, malaria, dengue, um, that we thought previously we had under control. And at the same time, we're witnessing the emergence of new diseases like Zika that we are desperately scrambling to understand. How did we get here? It's pretty simple. And I think it's fair to say, and this is a great headline, I'm trying to be sort of democratic about the, uh, uh, the news uh, sources that I, I target here. So this is one from Fortune. Um, so this is a, a headline uh, uh, that appeared uh, just a couple of days ago. Why the US has a limited arsenal to fight Zika mosquitoes. So the question is, how did we get here? It's very simple. We have overused drugs and insecticides. <coughs> And the parasites that cause disease and the insects that transmit them have become resistant very quickly. I, don't, I think this uh, picture illustrates it beautifully. Uh, there are now some 500, nearly 600 species of, of insects that are resistant to some 300 different insecticides that we use for pest control. That's pretty staggering statistics. And all of that's taken place in the last well, since the 1950s when we had the development and release of modern insecticides. So it's, um, I think it should be pointed out that we are now reliant on a very small number of insecticide classes to achieve pest control. We mainly rely on synthetic pyrethroids, uh, which are considered the, the preferred option because they're the least toxic of all of the uh, chemical weapons we have at our disposal. 
and uh, also organophosphates, which are, are, are less desirable but still used in emergency situations. They are more toxic, not only to insects but to a variety of other organisms. And we're wondering what's going to happen if we lose these. So we, we um, are losing our, our arsenal or, or depleting our arsenal. If you couple this then with unprecedented population growth as illustrated here, urbanization, deforestation, habitat loss, we've set ourselves up for the perfect storm. The geographic ranges of mosquitoes and the geographic ranges of humans are constantly overlapping now and that makes human mosquito encounters much more common. Just like thrones, uh, we are facing some threats associated with impending climate change. It's just that ours isn't a move towards uh, cooler temperatures. So I'm just going to keep uh, playing on that theme there. So winter is coming. Now, Jon Snow knows winter is coming. He doesn't know much, but he does know that winter is coming. And he does know that the White Walkers are, are going to cross over the wall. Um, now, most folks have dismissed tales about winters long ago when mythical creatures roamed the earth. Meanwhile, the leaders in the capital charged with protecting the masses are obsessed with things like re-election. And they are doing nothing to prepare the nation for the coming winter. Still not convinced of the parallels? <laughs> now, this is a little out of date and a little unfair because only a couple of days ago, uh, Congress released uh, or approved 1.1 a billion uh, in funding to support Zika research and mainly for vaccine development. But uh, it, it, was, it was appropriate at the 15th of July um, when we, and, and, and not three days later, we had local transmission of Zika in Florida. So um, it, was a, it was a worrying time um, because we were very concerned um, that we would have an, um, continued support to investigate new uh, controls for Zika. So could infectious diseases control be a very short-lived phenomena for us, just a sort of blip in the, human, uh, the history of humankind? I think it's fair to say that mosquito-borne diseases are becoming more common and they will continue to become uh, much more common. We're going to experience more epidemics. Life is starting to look a little precarious here in Westeros. Excuse me, I'm just getting a message. Um, yes, a raven has arrived from King's Landing. Um, it was a white one. Winter is here. All right, what are we going to do? This is what we're going to do. So, our first, <laughs> good luck. All right, so our first generation of antibiotics and insecticides, the penicillins, the DDT insecticides, um, I think you should know that they were very low cost um, discoveries. They were very effective strategies and relatively speaking, they were fairly easy to find. You could say they were the low hanging fruit. But if we have a quick glance at our armory, um, we have very few weapons for fighting infectious diseases. We're down to just a few, a couple of drugs and a couple of insecticides. You could say it's just a crossbow and a, and a couple of broadswords. So where are the new uh, replacements coming from? Unfortunately, we're going to have to dig much, much deeper beneath the snow to find our next stash of dragon glass. I'd like to introduce you to the White Walkers of our world. Um, they're not made of ice. They don't have blue eyes. Um, but are they the White Walkers? In a sense, yes. Their weapons are not swords of ice or armies of undead, but incredibly microscopic viruses and parasites. They've been dubbed the most dangerous animals on the planet, and uh, this reputation is fairly earned if you consider the human death toll associated with mosquito-borne diseases. Mosquitoes have caused more death than any other, more human death than any other animal. And by last count, um, approximately 500,000 human deaths in 2015. Most of those deaths were related uh, to malaria infections. So here are the two uh, greatest but tiniest winged warriors. On the left, you have Aedes aegypti, which is commonly referred to as the yellow fever mosquito. And on the right, you have Anopheles gambi, which is commonly termed, excuse me, the malaria mosquito. I'm going to focus this talk on, on Aedes aegypti. Um, Aedes is a very good vector of viruses. We call it a vector of arthropod-borne viruses. The medical entomology slang for that is arboviruses. And Aedes transmits four viruses that we know about. These are the viruses that cause dengue, yellow fever, 
uh, chikungunya, which you might not have heard of, and Zika. And these four viruses are either neuroinvasive, they cross the blood-brain barrier and cause meningitis and encephalitis, or they, they affect the mucosal lining and cause hemorrhagic disease. So they're not very pleasant. So I just want to play a little bit further with the whole uh, concept of, of, uh, of white walkers. So Tom, I'm, just, I'm also going to explore Zika a little bit. So Tom Fryden, who's the director of uh, CDC, has made this statement. Zika will be a sobering and long-term problem for the US. It sounds like something new, but it's actually not. Um, it's been around for a while. It was in, in discovered first in 1947 um, in Africa, and there have been several outbreaks since then in Polynesia and Micronesia. But what really caught our attention was the outbreak that took place across the Americas starting in 2015, and the coincidence of the large number of human cases with the uptick in microcephaly, which is a condition where babies are born with um, smaller brains and smaller heads. More recently, Zika made its way to the United States. There are now over 100 cases of locally acquired Zika reported in Florida. What that means is that the local Aedes aegypti population is infected with Zika and capable of transmitting it to the human population. In fact, it's been proposed that our generation and subsequent, well, this generation will be called Generation Zika. Um, and because it's the, the event that's had the most impact, uh, will have the most impact, or is projected to have the most impact on, on this particular generation. We're very worried about Zika because it is neuroinvasive and it, and it causes microcephaly. It also causes a number of other neurological complications. One of those is Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an immunological um, a condition. And it can also be sexually transmitted, which is unheard of for a mosquito-borne disease. It's been estimated the cost for caring for one child born to a, a, a mother infected with Zika during pregnancy over the lifespan of that child will be $10 million. If you consider that we're estimating we could have as many as 20,000 babies born to Zika-infected mothers one year in the United States, you can easily see that healthcare bill a ballooning. And uh, the other reason we're very concerned about it is because we don't know what the long-term healthcare consequences of Zika will be, what, how it might be linked to dementia or Alzheimer's or uh, schizophrenia, for instance. Um, so it is concerning. Um, and why has uh, dengue and Zika exploded across the United States, uh, excuse me, across the world? That's because Aedes aegypti has managed to populate um, many, many uh, corners of the globe. You're looking at the global distribution, uh, uh, well, a risk map for the global distribution of, of uh, Aedes. So wherever you see the orange colouring uh, is where we have a very high chance of encountering Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. And you should see that the United States is included in this as is most, uh, most of the tropical regions and neotropical regions of the world. So it has a very wide global distribution. Um, and the other problem with Aedes is that it is exquisitely adapted to life with humans. It likes to exploit urban environments. It likes to live in close proximity with its human host. Um, it also exploits a number of cryptic sites. So around the home, it likes to live in containers and septic tanks and gutters and pot plants. Uh, it's very hard to find all of those sites and treat the mosquitoes that, that uh, might be breeding there. And it's a very difficult mosquito to control. Um, and in fact, um, we are having uh, trouble controlling uh, Zika um, in Florida because we suspect um, the Aedes aegypti populations there might be resistant to insecticides. We've been applying insecticides in Florida for a very long time. And, uh, and now we're worried that we've created resistant mosquitoes and therefore that it's harder to control Zika. So what's the view from the wall? Well, oh, actually, I'm going to ask you a hot seat question before we go there. Ah, yes. What is the most effective way to control mosquito-borne diseases, in your opinion? Is it drugs, vaccines, or insecticides? I already know the answer to this question, so I'm kind of cheating, but um, I'm interested to explore your thoughts. And maybe we'll just pop back. I don't know if I can go back to the previous poll. Who's voted? Oh, I can't. Oh, yeah, maybe I can. Oh, dear. We're split on whether or not we should kill off mosquitoes. So it's, it's a 50-50 split. So, uh, so, well, that's pretty democratic. Okay. Um, 
Right. So I'm going to let you continue with your poll. Um, I know what I'd vote for, but I, I won't. Uh, I'll, I'll refrain from voting. All right. So the view from the wall. Uh, in my opinion, it's actually we can view dawn from the wall. Um, I, I can see the dawn on the horizon. Maybe others can't, but I can. So uh, what's the night what the night's watch been up to? What are scientists really working on? And I have to I have to laugh because sometimes the life of a scientist does feel a, a tad like you're alone on a 700 foot wall of ice facing a bunch of wild things. Okay, not Canadians, but anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. So what are the new technologies on the horizon and when can we expect delivery? What will be the consequences of those new technologies? When is somebody going to find a secret stash of dragon glass to fight mosquito-borne diseases? Historically, and this might surprise you, um, the, the, the most effective way to control mosquito-borne diseases has actually been with insecticides. Medicines and vaccines have been uh, very good, but insecticides have had the greatest impact. Um, now, I'm not going to talk about uh, vaccines and, and medicines. I'm not a medical doctor and it's not my area of expertise. But you should know, I think, that scientists consider our prospects for developing vaccines against mosquito-borne viruses are pretty good. We already have a vaccine against yellow fever. Um, we have a vaccine in clinical, oh, and it's just, just been released for, for dengue, and it's about 65% effective at controlling uh, dengue in the population or preventing dengue. And as you probably know, there are multiple efforts afoot to develop a Zika vaccine. The estimates are that those vaccines may be as far away as 18 months or more, but they are in development and people are trying to fast track them. But in fact, um, one of the most effective ways at controlling mosquitoes is, act, excuse me, mosquito borne diseases is, is through mosquito control. And there are many, many uh, um, approaches we can use. We can use repellents, we can use traps, we can use deterrent devices. I'm not going to cover any of those. I'm going to focus on two things, insecticides and GMO mosquitoes. I'm going to focus on insecticides because they are really the mainstay of our control strategy. Um, historically, they've been the most effective weapon against mosquito-borne diseases, and that is best illustrated here. If you hadn't heard, thanks to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, since 2000, there's been a massive investment, um, a very big eradication campaign against the Anopheles gambi mosquito that transmits malaria. And this has brought global malaria deaths down from 1.5 million per year to about 435,000. That's a significant reduction. It's still 435,000 deaths too many, but it is a massive impact on, on malaria and malaria transmission. And everybody thought that this was due to medicines, but in fact, if you look at the data, um, it's largely due to insecticides, and that's what you're seeing on the right-hand side. Um, the green and the purple bars are insecticide-treated bed nets, so bed nets that are treated with synthetic pyrethroids and given to the population, and uh, indoor residual sprays. These are sprays that are sprayed onto the uh, walls of houses, and mosquitoes rest indoors. They come in contact with the insecticides, and they are, are repelled and killed. So about 70% of malaria control or reduction in cases has been, is, we estimate, has been achieved through use of insecticides. So there's the argument for insecticides. Um, but the problem is that insecticides target the insect nervous system. And they're also neurotoxic to humans and other organisms such as fish and honeybees. Unfortunately, for the foreseeable future, we're probably going to be reliant on insecticides. Uh, that's the consensus, whether it is palatable to you and I or not. It is probably what we will be using to control insects. The, the, the good thing is that those insecticides will get much smarter. Now, there's two strategies that we're looking at to find new insecticides. The first is the overlooked insecticides. Um, it costs about $250 million to develop an insecticide. And it's not surprising then that there's been no investment in public health insecticides in the last 30 years because there just isn't a market. Most of these diseases are transmitted um, in third world developing countries. But recently, uh, a consortium, a non-for-profit called the Innovative Vector Control Consortium, um, has got together many companies and encouraged them to look back through their stash of failed chemistries, those that didn't make it to market for one reason or another and got overlooked. And they have succeeded in uh, getting about five new insecticides into the uh, insecticide uh, development pipeline. And, uh, you know, there's some very good hope that we will have new insecticides 
uh, for control of, of mosquitoes um, in the next couple of years. They still target the nervous system. Those insecticides still affect the nervous system of the insect. But they at least give us some, some tools to overcome the insects that have become resistant to the previous classes of insecticides. And then there's another strategy, um, and this is the work that um, myself and many others are doing, and this is called designer uh, insecticides or uh, rational design of insecticides for mosquito control. Um, to better understand this, I think, if I could turn the page, definitely can't, I'm having trouble here. You need to understand that every species has a unique DNA script. Um, it is our own personal book. Even the humble mosquito has uh, a unique DNA code that we can exploit. So if you have the ability to read the code and you can team up with people that engineer molecules, chemical makers, so code breakers and molecule makers, um, theoretically you can disrupt unique targets in the insect or unique processes and pathways that only operate in that one particular species. So it's, very, it's, it's exquisitely selective. And what you're seeing here um, is uh, a target in the, in the mosquito, in the 80s Egypti mosquito, and then a molecule that we're designing as an insecticide to, to, um, to bind or interact with that target and lead to death or paralysis of, of the insect. The benefit of these strategies is that they are selective. Now the downside of both insecticidal strategies is of course this. The consequences of high insecticide use are insecticide resistance. And you can, it's better, no better illustrated than what you see here. Uh, this is what is happening with uh, resistance to synthetic pyrethroids and malaria mosquitoes. This is a direct result of the intense campaign to release insecticide treated bed nets and use indoor residual sprays in sub Saharan Africa to control the mal malaria mosquito. You can, the red dots are populations of mosquitoes that are resistant to insecticides. In 2000, there were a few populations. Uh, in 2013, there are a lot of populations that carry resistance to synthetic pyrethroids and that threatens our ability to continually control malaria. So if we go ahead and develop new classes of insecticides, new designer insecticides, we have to do so knowing full well that within about 10 or 15 years, um, we won't have those weapons anymore because the insects will have developed resistance. Uh, and, and so we need to be putting in place what we call resistance management strategies to prolong the life of those products as much as we can. Oh, wait, before I go there, let's just see who thought, who thought what. Oh, vaccines. Well, that's too bad I didn't talk much about vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In fact, the audience is, 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 is correct. Vaccines are a great strategy for combating infectious diseases um, and, and so are drugs. Um, and in, really, in reality, what we need to be doing is using all three uh, in combination. Right. Controlling, uh, controlling mosquitoes using modified, or controlling diseases using modified mosquitoes. Of all of the strategies that are out there under consideration by scientists around the globe, this is probably the, the most controversial, it's the most high risk and most high reward. There are multiple strategies under consideration here, I cannot cover them all and it is also not my area of expertise. But you can think about them as sort of breaking down in two ways. One is a strategy to eliminate the enemy. You introduce a lethal gene, um, you make the population crash, it's no longer able to transmit a disease. And this is a strategy being used by a company called Oxitec. The other strategy is to disarm the enemy. Um, and uh, in, in this strategy, you introduce something uh, that uh, interferes with the ability of the mosquito to transmit a disease. You render it incapable of transmitting a disease. You don't kill the insect, but you make it incapable of disease transmission. You disarm its ability to transmit. Um, and this is something that's being uh, pursued by uh, a non-profit uh, called Eliminate Dengue. I think you should know that um, you, I wouldn't call the second strategy, strategy a genetic uh, modification strategy, but it does involve the introduction of a foreign organism that doesn't naturally circulate in the mosquito population. Of the two strategies, strategy one is the true genetic modification strategy. They've both gone into field trials. They have both released um, modified mosquitoes into the environment. They're both experiencing very good success with those field trials. Um, 
and I think both of these strategies will, will they're expanding um, in terms of their global uh, field trials um, and I think you'll see both of those uh, continue uh, going forward. Now making transgenic mosquitoes or genetically modified mosquitoes sounds very simple but it isn't and scientists have been playing around with this since about the 1970s. Um, we keep developing toolkits uh, to um, introduce genetic material or genes into a mosquito population. The one that you've um, heard about most recently probably is CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, discuss that. There's actually a talk coming up by Bill Muir, uh, two talks from now. Um, he is a geneticist and an expert in this area and he will cover that. Um, so the Oxitec strategy is, uh, is really interesting. Um, it involves the introduction of a lethal gene uh, so that uh, the progeny die at the larval or pupil stage. Now, um, and, and what you do is you modify the male and mass rear it and introduce it into the environment. Males can't blood feed, um, so there's no uh, risk of, of disease transmission. And of course, you cause the population ultimately uh, to crash. And that lethal gene isn't switched on until the mosquito is introduced into the environment. So, so people argue that it's, it's fairly safe. It's very akin to the sterile insect strategies that have been used for many years. Um, to control a uh, screw worm fly. But it doesn't have an inherent mechanism for making it spread through the population. One of the problems with transgenic strategies is that you, your gene, your transgene that confers the effect that you want gets diluted as mosquitoes breed. Um, and, and you don't want that. You, you want to have it um, uh, populate uh, the, the mosquitoes. And, and so the issue for Oxitec is that their lethal gene doesn't have a drive mechanism. So what they have to keep doing is rearing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mosquitoes and releasing those constantly into the field. And they have to hope that they outcompete the wild mosquito population. But they've run uh, trials in Brazil, Panama, Cayman. They've just been approved to run a field trial in Key Haven, Florida. Um, and, and it looks like... Um, their, their strategy is very effective at suppressing the mosquito population almost to the point where it crashes and you, and you don't have disease transmission. There are a couple of concerns. Um, some mosquitoes do survive that, that uh, lethal gene and they go on to survive in the environment. So the systems may be a little bit leaky um, and people are a little bit concerned about that. So. So Oxitec has always said that um, one of the benefits of their strategy is that um, all of the transgenic material will, um, or GMO mosquitoes, will die out. And that might not be true. There are other people that are taking strategy one even further. They're playing around with things like maleness genes, where we convert um, all the, the females in the population into males. It's like a switch, a master switch. Um, once again, males don't transmit and you would eventually cause the population to crash. People joke around that it's a dead end for the mosquitoes, boom, boom. Um, other people are playing around with sterility genes. So they sterile, uh, these are genes that would force the female to become sterile and so she can't produce eggs. Um, but all of them uh, struggle with the fact that this gene, whatever it is, has to be driven into the population. Um, and, and that is a challenge. That is a very significant challenge that must be overcome for these strategies to be effective. Um, strategy two, um, uh, the Eliminate Dengue program, is where the mosquito effect effectively becomes infected with a bacteria. And you can see that um, here. It's a bacteria called Wabakia. Um, and it infects the mosquito cells. Those are the little blobs that you see inside the uh, insect cell. Um, so the mosquito is infected. And the interesting thing about Wabakia is that it interferes with the ability of the mosquito to transmit dengue. So when the mosquito is infected with Wolbachia, it doesn't transmit dengue very well. And uh, so um, Wolbachia is, is present in many insect species. It's um, found uh, in, in, in many species and, uh, and was introduced into to the mosquito to try to suppress uh, dengue transmission. Uh, the Eliminate Dengue program has conducted field trials in Australia and they found um, the interesting thing about Wolbachia is that it has its own uh, drive mechanism, so it can spread itself through the population. And when they've gone back out there and recaptured the mosquitoes, um, they find that the Wolbachia is spreading very nicely through the population. So it's spreading um, and it's likely um, suppressing the dengue uh, transmission. Here's the catch. We don't actually know how it works yet. We don't really know yet how Wolbachia bacteria suppress dengue transmission by the mosquito. 
So here we are releasing Wolbachia infected mosquitoes into the environment, but we still don't quite know how it works. And I, I do think that is cause for concern. But this has been uh, funded by the Gates Foundation um, and large scale field trials are planned in, in Brazil and Colombia. All right, so what are the questions that keep mosquito biologists up at night? Um, I think there's little doubt that we're going to see GMO uh, or release of GMO mosquitoes to control pests and mosquito vectors of disease. And this is going to take place in the next 10 to 15 years. We're very close now. Um, and I think you will see a number of, of um, entities um, pursue this strategy to its bitter end. Um, so the things that we worry about are, are questions like, what if we inadvertently create mosquitoes that are better at transmission rather than worse? What if we inadvertently create mosquitoes that are more aggressive biters um, or that displace other species out of the environment that we didn't want to disrupt? Maybe, I, I don't know, you could use your imagination, but um, these are the sort of things we think about. The other question is, how will they outcompete the wild population? If you're modifying a mosquito, you're actually affecting its fitness. And, uh, and so it's not as fit as the wild population. So how does it compete with the wild population of mosquitoes? What's the battle that goes on out there in the field? If we wipe them out, what is the ecological niche um, that, that they leave behind? And what's going to fill that void? Because something will. Something will ultimately fill that void. What are the consequences of a genetic system that's leaky? We've got no idea. We have absolutely no idea the answer to that question. We're really asking what are the unintended consequences. You don't know what you don't know, and that's a problem. The other thing we're sort of <laughs> struggling with is how you get informed consent and regulatory approval, not just in one country, but globally, because these strategies will have to be applied um, and enacted globally in order to be successful. And we don't have the answers to these questions yet. Um, just as with Zika, we don't understand very much about it. It's going to take us decades to find out the answers to these questions. At the same time as scientists and public health specialists, we have to weigh our own moral obligations. The burden, the impact of human disease, morbidity and mortality versus the consequences, the unintended consequences of strategies that are fairly effective but could have some downsides. So uh, some of my colleagues have proposed a world without mosquitoes. In fact, they've suggested that we should try to eliminate mosquitoes from the planet. Um, and this is Aedes aegypti again. It's been described as the cockroach of mosquitoes. I think that's a very unfortunate reputation. Um, <laughs> uh, one prominent scientist has said, and I quote, and I won't tell you who it is, it is our moral duty to eliminate this mosquito from the planet. And some entomologists support the idea of eliminating Aedes for several reasons. They believe that it would have a negligible ecological impact. One of the reasons why is that it's an urban mosquito and so it lives very closely with its human host and it really largely exploits the human host. The argument that they're using there is that it's not a major or influential player in the food chain and I don't know that that's necessarily correct. So before we set about eliminating these creatures, we should consider two things. First, and this may surprise you, we actually don't know very much about the biology of mosquitoes. We recognise about 3,600 species of mosquitoes worldwide on the planet. And only a handful of those are actually vectors of disease or nuisance biters. The rest don't necessarily take a blood meal or transmit disease. But we don't know much about them. Why do we not know much about mosquitoes? Well, it's the reason is that for the last 100 years, since we figured out mosquitoes transmit disease, we've been focused, our singular focus has been largely on how to kill them, right? Not about how amazing their biology is, but how to kill them dead. And, and we are all, and I would, I would suggest um, all of us here, uh, and myself included, we're actually the victims of a very subtle smear campaign. <laughs> Here's the image that you most often see. It's the blood-feeding female mosquito. She's poised to attack with her mouth parts inserted. And, she, um, and oftentimes the media will, will sort of show you this and then they'll, they'll play some audio with it as well, that sound of the mosquito buzz. Hmm. Um, but what if I were to show you this image? Would it surprise you? It actually surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> um, the biology of mosquitoes is actually truly amazing and very poorly understood. 
Um, mosquitoes do visit flowers. They do visit flowers to take sugar meals or uh, to, um, to get carbohydrates and energy. Um, some of them do probably pollinate flowers. Um, they actually have a very important role probably in the food chain. They are food sources for bats and birds and fish and even other insects. But that we have a very poor grasp of. Um, and uh, it was only recently, we've known that mosquitoes visit flowers for a long time, they rest on flowers, but it's only recently that we actually figured out, hey, we could exploit this for mosquito control. We could lure a mosquito into a sugar-baited trap and then kill them. So um, <laughs> before we go about considering to eliminate entire species from the planet, it might behoove us to better understand their biology. Um, we may miss opportunities um, like the one I just talked about. And the second reason that I suggest it's probably not a good idea to try and think about or try to eliminate mosquitoes is it can go horribly wrong. We know it can. It's happened before. This is, uh, if you didn't know, uh, starting in the 1940s, there was a, a, a campaign across the Americas to try to eradicate the 80s Aegypti campaign. Um, and this is just one example I could illustrate with, with several. And uh, so the Pan American Health Organization and various countries uh, such as Brazil um, got uh, involved and uh, decided that they would come together to uh, eliminate 80s Aegypti. And uh, so starting in the 1930s, you can see the distribution of 80s Aegypti in, in uh, the Americas. Um, the campaign ran uh, for throughout, uh, up until about the 70s, and then it stopped. It was very expensive, it was quite effective, um, and a number of countries disengaged, um, and uh, you know, thought we had a pretty good handle on 80s Egypt. I had certainly been knocked out in a number of places. So by 1970, you can see uh, things are looking pretty good. By 2011, something has happened. And Aedes aegypti has gone back into those habitats, and then some. It didn't just go back to uh, its, its uh, previous geographic range. It's actually grown, uh, expanded its geographic range. Now, you may not think that's important, but then let me show you this map. This is the distribution of dengue hemorrhagic fever. It's the hemorrhagic form of dengue. Uh, it's not very common, but it can be fatal. And uh, you can see, uh, I forget what the years are here, but um, there was not any dengue hemorrhagic fever uh, in South America um, prior to uh, the elimination campaign. And now there's dengue hemorrhagic, the incidence of dengue hemorrhagic fever um, in the present day is pretty widespread. Um, and, and there are lots of reasons for that. So we need to be very, very careful when we're thinking about um, eliminating species. So, um, as one person has said, you know, genetic modification tools, they're powerful tools that they, and they could help win the war for us. But that was exactly the sentiment that people felt when things like DDT first came along. And we all know what's happened with DDT. It's good to be optimistic, but we need to be realistic as well. That's actually Zach Edelman from Texas A&M University. And the Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation has a, a nice perspective on this as well. We are not targeting to eliminate mosquitoes we are targeting to eliminate human disease. All right. So thank you for staying uh, 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 with me through the science part. Uh, I can see so everybody still thinks vaccines. OK. I didn't manage to, uh, to change your. Uh, all right. So I'm going to ask you, should we release uh, GMO mosquitoes to prevent epidemics of diseases such as Zika? That's up to you to uh, decide whether you agree or disagree. I'm interested to capture your thoughts. And then I'm going to start another poll just for fun. <laughs> Who will win Game of Thrones? Come on, you know that's why we're all really here. We're all Thrones fans. Back to my original question. Who is going to win Game of Thrones? Now, we know that Martin shuns the standard Hollywood plot. Obviously, he does. He killed off Eddard Stark and Rob Stark very early on. <laughs> Much to my disappointment. Now, I suspect the answer to this question is that no one wins the Game of Thrones. And this is true in infectious diseases as well. It is simply a constant and never-ending fight. You might sit on the throne for a very brief period. I don't know why you would want to. It looks like a very uncomfortable chair. But your reign will be short, right? 
we are in a new era of infectious diseases, but this is a situation of our own making. We have been extremely complacent this past summer. Um, and uh, the last winter uh, was so long ago that we can't really remember it and we haven't been investing in the night's watch. So I do foresee that uh, we will continue our reliance on insecticides and we will continue to pursue GMO mosquitoes. There will be successes um, and these technologies will make some impact um, in the coming decades. There will also be unintended consequences. There's no doubt about that. And I, I can't offer any other perspective than that. We will have to constantly weigh our moral obligations, alleviating the burden of disease versus controlling with some strategies that might have some side effects. Um, but for infectious diseases, the stakes are very high and it would be irresponsible not to try. So, I don't know who's voting here on... I'll, I'll let you keep voting for a minute and we'll come back uh, to uh, Game of Thrones. Who moved my dragon glass? Right. If you know the, the book, uh, Who Moved My Cheese, um, you'll know that the premise is there's a creative advantage to constantly looking for new cheese slash dragon glass. Um, so our role as a scientist is to advance knowledge and to develop new technologies. It is to find new dragon glass. Okay, we don't dress in black. Um, but we do take an oath of sorts to conduct sound and ethical science for this night and all nights to come. And we do operate via a code. We do work really hard and it, we do good work um, and it's lonely. Many of our towers, I mean labs, are um, in disrepair. Um, and all this ranging beyond the wall is very expensive, uh, particularly when it happens at large scale. Our advances occur incrementally and slowly, but it's the only way that we develop new weapons to fight infectious diseases. So we must proceed with caution. Dragon glass not only kills white walkers, it can be used to create them. And so now I urge you, if you would, please return to your keeps and dispatch a raven to King's Landing requesting continued support for the Night's Watch. So we must never stop looking for new strategies and new stashes of dragon glass. They are the only things that are standing between us and the threat beyond the wall. And ultimately, we have to win the infectious diseases game of thrones or we become the last page in the saga that's our own song of ice and fire. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you, and let's go back to that poll to see who's going to win. Oh, no, pressing the wrong thing. Uh, let's see, what am I doing? Oh, I need to stop the poll. Uh, uh. Oh. Oh, I was hoping Sansa. <laughs> yes, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens, but you're going to have to wait a long time to find out, I think. So um, I really don't think it will be any, any well, my bet is it's, it's not any of these people. It's not going to be John, surely. Come on. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much for your attention um, and thank you to uh, the uh, Dawn or Doom uh, folks for the opportunity to present and all of the technical support that's been here today and I'll stop and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. I'll even answer questions on Game of Thrones. <laughs> no questions. Oh, there's a question at the back.
there's um, actually a lot of research going on, and you know, I'm, I unfortunately didn't have time to to cover it today. And there are quite a few species of mosquitoes that do like to feed not on humans but on, on other blood sources, including uh, birds. Um, and in fact, they'll preferentially feed on birds rather than on humans. And those mosquitoes have a very big role to play in disease transmission because they help diseases toggle between different species. And West Nile virus is a very good example of, of one of those diseases where, where that happens. Um, there is a lot of investment going on, as I, I guess you would say, renewed investment in um, natural products um, as new insecticides. And I, I didn't cover those today, and I would have liked to, but I, I just couldn't. Um, natural products are very attractive for a number of different reasons. Um, they have, they're more environment, or considered more environmentally benign. They have diff fewer regulatory hurdles for product registration. Um, and a lot of people are looking at uh, plant extracts um, that uh, have, there's very good evidence that they have uh, strong repellency and even toxicity uh, to mosquitoes and ticks. Uh, um, and so it's a very hot area of research. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a thinking that it might be possible to even get some of those products uh, approved earlier than some of the more traditional insecticides, small molecule insecticides, because they are natural products. Um, but we still don't know how they work. Um, that's actually what a lot of us are sort of scratching our heads about. It's like, how do these, how do these work? Um, and, you know, sort of playing around with your, your species idea, I mean, people do you they talk about push-pull strategies where they push mosquitoes away or pull them into, into other areas. And certainly scents and, and things like that, you know, how something smells can be, you know, people are looking at how you could, it could be exploiting that uh, for mosquito control. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Oh, how, how I, um, yes, well, uh, probably not as effective as, you know, some of the, some of the other strategies that we, we've discussed. But, you know, when we get really desperate for mosquito control, we'll do anything. And I think you're seeing some of that play out in Florida right now with Zika. So, yeah. Yes? <laughs> Is that, okay, so I get question one first. <laughs> okay, um, yes, the short answer is yes. Um, Indiana is, um, <laughs> so the question was, is Indiana at risk for, for transmission of Zika and um, local transmission of Zika? So there have been a number of cases in Indiana of Zika that has been acquired by people who've traveled out of the, out of the state, out of the country, um, been infected somewhere else and come back to Indiana and have developed Zika. But I think what you're talking about is domestic uh, or local transmission. Um, you saw the map where I showed the distribution of Aedes aegypti. It's the primary vector of Zika. Um, it has been reported in the state, but it, we think it's not very common here. So there is a risk, but it is low, um, that we could have a, a local transmission of, of Zika here. The one thing to think about is there's actually another species of mosquito called Aedes aegypti, which I didn't talk about today, which is also a vector of Zika. It's not as good as Aedes aegypti, but it is a vector, and it does occur throughout the state. So it's another example of one of those things where we're going to have to wait and see see what plays out. The short answer is yes. Did, okay. And the second thing is, is um, do, mosquito, do mosquitoes like dry ice and why or why not? <laughs> mosquitoes do like dry ice at a distance. <laughs> um, dry ice releases carbon dioxide um, as it gases off and mosquitoes are attracted to carbon dioxide and so some mosquito biologists will exploit uh, dry ice to attract mosquitoes. So they put it into traps um, that they put out in the field and the mosquitoes fly up a, a gradient um, towards the carbon dioxide source. So, um, but they don't like it. <laughs> it's lethal uh, uh, on contact. So, <laughs> yeah. Was there another question at the back? So getting back to um, Zika in Indiana, like how far into the future and like how many people who live in Indiana would have to contract it potentially elsewhere and bring it back for it to be able to establish 
So yeah, that's a great people. question. So now we're into sort of epidemiology and disease modelling, and I don't know the answers to those questions. And I, I don't know that you know anybody does yet. It's going to be quite some time before we have we're able to be sort of that predictive about the the epidemiology. Um, you know, I think we're collecting data from what's going on in the Americas, and that will feed into sort of modelling around around that. But there are a number of questions that you know we still don't have a good handle on now. You know, um, and I'll just give you a, a couple. Um, you know, we still don't know what percentage of the wild mosquito population is infected with Zika. If a hundred hundred mosquitoes, if you have a hundred mosquitoes and they're all infected with Zika, uh, and you get a bite from one, what's your chance? You know, of, of contracting Zika. Um, we've got no idea. Um, we don't know how many people contract, um, maybe get exposed to Zika, but we know whether they progress towards uh, disease. We've just got no idea about that yet. And, and, and that's, where, that's why we're requesting money and support and funding to begin to understand those things so that we can answer questions like yours. And then another question would be, uh, are there people who just have like a natural immunity to Zika probably. or dengue or yellow fever? I mean, fever? probably, yeah. Um, so I, I think, still, we still don't know, but um, I think the answer to that um, is going to be yes. One of the reasons that um, Zika exploded across the Americas is that it got into a naive population with no protective immunity. Um, so I think there's evidence that... Um, once you've been exposed to Zika, you probably will have protective immunity. There's a bit of a question going. So dengue and Zika are very closely, they're very similar. And there's a bit of a question and a bit of concern around uh, the similarities between dengue and Zika. Um, and, and whether if you've been exposed to dengue, whether that kind of primes you to Zika or vice versa. You probably, you might know about dengue, the four or five serovars of dengue and how they can kind of... Um, if you get one and then get an another one, you can progress to dengue hemorrhagic fever, and I think that's sort of the concern with Zika. It's also a concern for vaccine development in that developing a vaccine for Zika, we don't know what that's going to do in terms of your reaction to dengue, and they're all things that we have to figure out. Yeah. So, but yes, there will be protective immunity. I just don't know. I don't know how much <laughs> or what that means. Theoretically, you're, I think, protected. Um, for, uh, well, I don't know how long for, um, but you do have protective immunity. Um, but you could still acquire the virus, and I, I, I don't know then what, what, it's just a big bag of, bag of unknown. Yeah. I think we're running out of time, but we have time for one more question. Um, what's your preferred type of personal insect repellent? Like, what do you <laughs> <laughs> Well, up until, well, DEET, <laughs> um, so uh, I, I have loved DEET this year. Me and DEET are getting along like houses on fire. Uh, it's been the worst uh, mosquito season uh, this past summer I have ever experienced in Indiana, and I'm beginning to wonder why. But DEET, um, and we always say, you know, you want to find, we don't give product recommendations, but... Um, what you want is a product that has 20 to 30 percent active ingredient DEET. Don't get the 10 or the 15, get the 20 or 30. Follow the label directions closely, reapply it when you need to. The thing that drives me nuts about DEET is that you can't put it everywhere and mosquitoes seem to find that one spot that you didn't put it. So, um, you know, which is typically around your face because you're not supposed to put DEET on your face. But it's an extremely effective product. Um, it's uh, what we really, it's the front line of, in personal protection. It's really what every, everybody should be doing to protect yourself against Zika, dengue and West Nile virus. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.